My name is John Swindler. I am a faculty member at the Lamar Dodd School of Art where I'm in the printmaking and book arts area. Um, going back, I, um, I was raised on a farm, a wheat farm in uh, western Kansas and uh, attended um, undergrad at a, at a small school in northwest Kansas called Fort Hayes State University. It's where I took my first printmaking class and which where I was initially introduced to to, to art, um, and so I, I had some great mentors there, some 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 great professors, um, and then from Fort Hayes, I I went to Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, it's where I received my MFA, and again had some great mentors and, and professors there, and um, and then spent a was fortunate, I only had one year between grad school and, and, a, and my first tenure track job, which was at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. I taught there for four years and then, um, and then got the job here at UGA in 2008 and have been here ever since. I think, that, I think it's a great time for printmaking. You know, I feel like now I've sort of been doing it long enough that I've seen, I've seen uh, some shifts. You sort of see things ebb and flow. And right now, as far as printmaking and its presence in, in, in larger culture, it seems like it, it has more, um, there's more visibility now. And even if it's something like, you know, I, there's a goofy commercial not long ago that like showed somebody uh, pulling a print and packing it and shipping it. Uh, but the fact that there was a press and somebody pulling a print on a national commercial is 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 important to to a large degree in terms of like raising overall awareness of, of what it is that we do. Because I'm sure you've 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 had conversations with like your parents and your students have had conversations with their parents. Like, what do you do? I make prints, and and people's idea of what prints are and and what it is we do are so there's such a gulf between that, and so. I think I think now there's at least a little bit more happening in relation to filling in that filling in that gulf, and of course it's not complete because because we're in the trenches trenches and we're 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 the active uh, we're the active makers we're the active you know like we're generating the ideas that are that are that are pushing the medium forward, um, but at the same time I think as long as there's a, a greater awareness of what it is we're doing it can only it can only help. <clears throat> But as far as the medium goes, I see, you know, you see different sort of, uh, I guess, threads um, going on. You know, you have, there's obviously in the last uh, several years, uh, you see woodcut and relief has made a huge um, leap in terms of, I don't know, it just, it, and, and, and there's a few people that, that you could, you can definitely give credit to. To in that regard, like Tom Huck and Sean Star Wars, Cannonball Press, Wolf Bat, and and uh, so and I think that's a great uh, that's a that's great especially for students that are that initial that initial sort of uh, taste of printmaking like there's something just so undeniable about that kind of work that it's so graphic and it's and it and it it has a um, there's an accessibility there. That that um, is a great is a great place to sort of grab onto students and 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 obviously drive by press and, and so and I I feel like a lot of that work is is still functioning within the the printmaking as a democratic medium and so that is about promoting both the medium itself and promoting ideas uh, in relation to social topics um, and you know and at trying potentially enacting social change um, and also you know simply prints as, as, a, as, a, as a means for, for illustration not and that not and I don't I personally don't feel like illustration or design are dirty words you know like I feel like it's all part of the same it's all part of the, the same conversation <clears throat> and then I think you have prints moving beyond uh, I don't, wouldn't even say moving beyond. It's but it's 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 prints that are that are more altruistic and prints that are looking at the medium in a in a in a more I guess I guess conceptually minded way, and and presenting them presenting them multiple in ways which are 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 um, hopefully you know new 
you know, uh, which is a difficult thing to achieve, and it shouldn't always, and, the, and new isn't always the goal, obviously. But what I talk to my students about oftentimes is like, we, we, are, we are finally moving into like this post-print world, this post-print culture, <clears throat> in which um, most of our information is accessed through, I don't even know what I did with my phone, I was going to put it up there, but um, our phones and our computers, and, and, and so as opposed to the printed word, as a, as opposed to publications, <clears throat> those are those still have relevance, but less and less so. And I feel like that's that's great for us as artists, as practitioners, in a way, because there's an egalitarian sort of of role role of that m mode of, of print making um, or making of prints. And so that is, in some ways, could be viewed almost as like a bondage <laughs> for us uh, that practice the medium. And so this post-print world to me represents an opportunity in which we're no longer tied to that you know we're no longer um, you know that that becomes um, I don't want to say it's it's part of its history because it's still it's still relevant and it will continue to be relevant but <clears throat> we can move things in a direction I think that that are that I think only heightens the the relevance of the medium within within contemporary art Those collages started um, as a way to repurpose all of this printed matter that had been accumulating. And I started in grad school printing primarily on, on uh, Japanese papers because I liked the luminosity, I liked the lightweight nature, and it also just makes, you know, paper by its very nature is much more transportable. That's one of the great things about being a printmaker. You can pack an entire show in a tube. Um, and so I, I and I, I I enjoy that. And so in Japanese paper, even more so. And, and Japanese paper is so forgiving in the sense that you can crumple it up, um, and then and then flatten it out and and, and 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 return to being pristine and perfect. And so it for me as in relation to my practice, which which tends to be kind of um, at times a little chaotic. You know, I need that. I need a material that's forgiving like that. And so. Um, back to your original question. So I had all this material that had built up, and it was so um, what I what I call leftover. So things from editions or other projects that sort of, of course, I wasn't going to throw away. Um, I consider myself a hoarder when it comes to, to to that kind of stuff. Like I always feel like there's an opportunity for that stuff to to be to be pulled in, or or at the time when I was keeping it, I didn't understand why, but I. I always liken it to growing up on the farm and my, my father and my grandfather always having like these containers just full of hardware bits and pieces of things. And I never really understood it totally until my dad would be like, hey, go over there and look for a, a, a 3 16 nut and invariably I'd find it in there. You know, like there was always things, you know, usable things in those, in those uh, containers of, of just, you know, stuff. And there were piles of there was always like a metal pile and there was always a wood pile and and that was that's what that stuff was there for it was just raw materials for building whatever we needed for a particular job and I really feel like that's what my piles of printed materials serve for me and so the the example for the um, the Chicago pile series uh, or the graphite bricks I think I've given them both kind of a couple names those were printed very specifically for an exhibition and which was they really wanted. Or those were made for an exhibition, which they were wanting something achromatic, and so they 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 wanted it grays and blacks and things of that nature. So therefore, I printed all that stuff with that with that in mind and composed those specifically from those from those printed elements. And it really is when I'm printing, um, I don't I don't personally love additioning that much. I'll I do it if the need arises. But I really enjoy the act of printing because it, as, as, as an extension of drawing. And so I use my plates, I use my blocks, I use my, my screens, my stencils as marks in a sense in which to build and accumulate information. <clears throat> and so um, and sometimes I, it, that's done in a, in a fairly, um, I guess, uh, formulaic, not, I, don't wanna, I don't like the word formulaic, but, but a systematic way. So I'm trying to achieve a particular quality, and other times it's like I need to play, and so I'll I'll let the I'll let the act of printing lead the development of, of the image, and and so and then once all that stuff is printed, and I have literally piles of this stuff, 
then I, I simply just began extracting from that, you know, and again, it's like those piles on the farm that I just start pulling from and, and using what's necessary. And I don't view any of that material as precious, you know, and I talk to my students about this stuff all the time. It's like what we make, nothing is precious, especially when you're a student in a way, like you, this is the time to be, to, to really be freewheeling with the work. And so I view it as like, you know, it's like paper and it's ink and it's time. Right. And, and, uh, but the paper and the ink, really have very little value, you know, as far as uh, monetarily speaking. And so if you can view it just as a resource, as a raw material from which to work, which to build something else from, <clears throat> then it, it frees you in a lot of ways. And so I think oftentimes prints become this sort of precious thing. And in certain cases they are. But um, I think when you, for me, when I'm really wanting to explore an idea, I, I, I have, I have to view it as just like a disposable resource in a way. So that, that's, yeah. Well, you know, I started this, I started this, I, you know, it's funny, you know, we, we end up being, I think we, we all end up sort of, we have certain tendency, tendencies and sensibilities which manifest very early in, in your education and in your, your, your artistic practice. And so for me, I remember, in undergrad, I was forced to edition all of all of my prints, especially like, and I was doing a lot of lithography at the time, and um, I didn't I didn't want to, you know, and I just would end up with all these prints. And so, at a certain point, I incorporated them into my, uh, and I started collaging with them and, and combining with painting and drawing as well, which I don't do as much of these days. I'm really more interested in just the, the nature of the prints, but. Um, that was just like a light bulb for me. It was like all of a sudden, all these things that I this I, that I could do with the multiple because it's like, well, I had ten of this thing, and what happens when all of a sudden, like, they all appear in a single image? And so that was to me a much more interesting way to use the multiple for for my practice. So that's re really where that derived from. Printmaking is a really like beautiful community. Um, you know, we, it's it's like it, it's it's very familial, and you and you see that on on display at the conferences. Um, and we just had a big group of students come back, and they were you know they were buzzing because of that. And I remember that in my first experience, which was uh, in Tempe, Arizona, I think nineteen ninety eight, um, when they hosted the conference. And all of a sudden, you 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 understand you're part of this larger this larger thing. And, and that's a really good feeling. I think we all need to find that. Um, and so I really, I give, a, I, I, I want to give a lot of my personal credit for my personal success to that community existing. And within that, there's been a lot of people that have helped me along the ways. I think, I think about my undergraduate professors, uh, Frank Nichols, who passed away last year and Gordon Sherman, who's still, still at Fort Hayes. They were both instrumental in my development. Uh, in various ways, I can kind of point to all these different people like, oh, I got this from that person, I got that from that person. Um, and in graduate school, my, my professor, who's, who's retired, uh, Joel Feldman, um, who's great, who who just one of these guys that would uh, leave your studio, he, he'd talk to you in your studio, and then he'd walk out, and you're like, what just happened, you know, and could you completely questioning everything you're doing? And so that, that, that was, that was a really, um, that, that was a good. That was a great experience. Um, he was a good mentor, um, and 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 now um, colleagues, you know, um, that I've had and worked with, continue to work with here at at, uh, at Georgia. Melissa Harshman's been a great mentor as far as uh, as far as my teaching and 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 maintaining a healthy studio practice. <coughs> um, and I can point to um, a number of artists in terms of people that inform me directly. Um, Sean Caulfield, who teaches up at the University of Alberta, um, he's, a, he's, a, he's a great guy and a great artist. Um, and I've had the opportunity to work with him on, on a number of projects. And so I think we've become friends over the years. And, so, and, I, and again, I think that speaks to the communal nature of printmaking is that a lot of my, who, who I viewed as my, my heroes within the field, we became friends. <laughs> uh, and, and so I, I enjoy that. And I, I enjoy now going to conferences and you know, students might come to me and say, "Hey, you know, they, they're aware of my work and and have questions." And I and I love being able to 
I love that one-on-one -on -one access that you have within this field. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, so many artists. I remember in undergrad, I was really interested in like the Eastern European prints, which Henry Klein uh, uh, does a really good job of promoting through the conferences. I remember the first time I found his table when I was just spent, I probably spent three hours there just going through all these beautiful little prints. And that informed my, that really informed the way my prints looked for a while. And then it, that, that continued to evolve. And, and then, um, and, and nowadays, as far as people, and I think Zach had asked this question, um, I, I, I still look, I try to look at quite a bit of work. Um, but I, I'm a little bit more careful these days, I think in a way, like I, I, and I, 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 I want to, I want to be aware of what's happening within the field, both within printmaking, contemporary printmaking, and, and the contemporary art world at large. But I'm, I also am a little careful because so much of that can 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 sort of enter your work, which is which is normal and fine. But I also, um, you know, I think we all want to achieve a level of authenticity within the work that we're doing, and so that's that's kind of a delicate balance. Um, but in printmaking. Um, you know, some of my favorite people working now are like Lisa Belosky at Wash U. Um, uh, Sean is still obviously one of my one of my all time favorites. Um, and um, um, oh, there's a, one of my students introduced me to an artist. She's she's a recent grad at Cranbrook. Uh, Bonnie Brenda Scott, man, really strong. Work. I think she ad identifies as a sculptor and a painter, but the work is all about printmaking. Um, process the process of making prints in, in one way or another, um, uh, I, and I recently uh, became aware of and, and got to hang out with Amanda Lee, who's sort of goes between at this point going between like Italy and, and Seattle, and uh, really beautiful kind of merging of photography and printmaking, um, which I which I really responded to, and and so yeah, I mean I, I there's so many great people. You guys are really fortunate right now to be going through this, you know, where you're at in your education, because this, there's just so many strong people doing so many different things. Like I said, you have, you have the woodcuts of Tom Huck, which speak to uh, Durr in, in a very, in a very direct way, but also of now. And then you also have people that are um, doing things where prints are this like ethereal, ephemeral thing that are um, intangible in a way. So it's like, it's a really interesting time for the Both. I mean, really, the way I like to approach those those collages is, um, I, I I start with a, a something to react to, something to respond to. Often, so what I'll do is I'll cut out a portion, and I'll adhere that to my rag. Paper. So it, again, all the printing is on Japanese paper, and so I lay that on. I, I adhere that to the rag paper, and I use a I use a film which I've I tried to promote as much as possible. It's a it's an archival. Uh, pressure sensitive film it's called Duramount and I basically put all my prints into stickers and so I uh, I adhere that first piece and then I respond to that so I kind of created a, a really simple registration system using tracing paper and just a pencil and so I'll lay a piece down and I respond to that and so the prints become kind of grow autonomously which is nice and, and it's not that there's not this, there's obviously a lot of decision making happening in that in that moment but they just kind of grow organically. And then um, it also gives me an opportunity to, to go back and extricate certain things if I choose to. So I can go back and, you know, if I'm, you know, it's that standing back from the thing and like, how is that, you know, assessing that? It's formal quality, it's balance and all of these notions of design. And then I can make further decisions and try to try to get things where they feel just right. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, it, it, it the, 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 the printing part and the and the construction of the collages are both fairly uh, loose and fairly organic. But in the end, I, I want the work to feel purposeful. I want I want it to feel judicious. I want there to be a quality to it that's really that feels um, considered. I had proposed that exhibition a long time ago. And it was supposed to happen, I so it was about over two years ago, maybe maybe two and a half, 
and it was supposed to happen last year and something happened with the, the, the scheduling. And so I got pushed back another year. And so the original thing that I had proposed, the concept for the piece that I wanted to install was very different than what it ended up becoming. And in a way, the, the, the way the piece ended up uh, manifesting in the space at, at uh, UNCC was a better, in my mind, like a better manifestation of that idea of raise frame raise, which the idea there is like the rate, you know, I think about it, I guess I, I, some of my work has some, some um, kind of concerns about consumption consumption of natural resources, consumption of natural materials. And so one of the, one of the ways that, that you see that on display or that I, that I see that is like through the, you know, the, the, the construction of, of, of new, like, you know, of new housing and, and a particular kind of construction where it's just like they build them as fast as they can and they try to fill them with humans and then, uh, Profit as much as possible, and but you know the construction generally is pretty shoddy. It's just like it's just like people want a new house. We're going to give them a new house, and and those things aren't built to last necessarily. So it's like that idea of raising the structure, framing the structure, and then raising R A R A Z E, which is destruction, which is bringing it back down. And so that that process, all um, sort of what I was trying to do within that space was kind of create. Um, you know, I don't. I wouldn't say I was trying to illustrate that idea. These two things, I think, were just fortunately came together in that in that installation. But um, the construction that's in that space on which I, I attached all kinds of all kinds of material. So a lot of it was just like detritus from the studio. So there were drawings, there were films that I used for printing. There were even little there were even little drawings that I I do in my studio if my kids come here, and and so I like. They want something to do, and I don't want to just stick them on my computer. So I give them like some some sumi ink and a brush and like mylar paper, things like that. So some of those things appeared in the installation, and everything ended up being black and white because, uh, or mostly black and white, um, because that's what I have been accumulating lately for some reason. That's what I've been working with lately, and um, so I used that that structure, which was meant to was which was a response to the architecture of that space, and it's. And I don't want to get too much into that because it's without having an image, uh, it's it's a little difficult. But it was it was really kind of a response to that space, <clears throat> um, and um, and so I I used that that lattice work in a sense as a uh, as as a as a device on which to to build what I feel like is a collage. It just becomes a dimensional collage in many ways. Early on, I um, when I first started making prints, I made lithographs and I made etchings. That was pretty much like all <clears throat> that's what we were taught in undergrad. Those two processes, which I was fortunate, like because those are technically speaking two of the most difficult. So I'm glad I had a really strong grounding in that. <clears throat> but but soon thereafter, I got I got a, I personally was bored within my own work of just that this one technique, and so I began to really. Um, push the idea of, of, of combining as many techniques within within a, an image as possible, and so that initially began just like I'm going to print this on top of this on top of this, and see what see what occurs. And I really started to notice the some really interesting um, reactions between different materials. You know, the way that a screen print lays on top of a, a lithograph lays on top of an etching lays on top of a woodcut. <laughs> And and so those those sort of the minutia of the of of that phenomenon to me was like really interesting and so I um, I continue I continue to explore that for me it, that that's ever you know like I'm always fascinated by that uh, and so and and add to that color as well something that I, I use a lot now is is the computer I, Photoshop is an extension of of the printmaking studio for me. I was one, I was again I was kind of raised by like old school like printmaking is blood sweat tears and ink and so um then the computer was seen as 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 a as a invading force or something <laughs> so it took me a while to kind of get into it but then once I did and I pretty much taught myself it was like the layers in photoshop are 
exactly like what we do in in the print studio like you all are sitting in right now you know it's like it's just a they're pixels instead of ink and so that has been such a such an incredible tool for me because I use it in my teaching and I use it in my own work because I feel like whatever I make once it can enter the digital realm then it's just like the the spokes on the wheel the opportunities the potential just grow infinitely and and in terms of like where I can take that thing so um and that that goes back to um, your original question very directly in my mind um, because it, it, that just that's just one more that's 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 one more way to visualize the image and 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 also inkjet I mean I'm a, I love inkjet I love the quality of inkjet I love the quality of a low quality inkjet print <laughs> you know like it it has its own innate it's its own innate thing. Um, but especially inkjet on Japanese papers. The, the paper that I print on a lot these days is is called Kozo Shi, um, and it's just beautiful. It's luminescent. <laughs> it's strong. It's great for all processes. And so I'm I'm a I'm a Kozo Kozo Shi fan. You know, I still I still try to maintain an active sketchbook. I think that's an important. I think that's just an important habit. Um, but I'll use that stuff. I'll scan that stuff in, and that can become that can work into you know. Because again, once it's in in the computer, then it I'm, I I can do anything with it. And so um, I but I, I I try not to do a, a whole lot of pre planning these days. And and I think what I so my I have I have two beautiful children. I have an eight year old and a four year old, and my spouse has an active career. And so, and and I'm an area head of the department here, which uh, comes with it a lot of administrative duties. You wouldn't think this would have anything to do with your question, but it does. Um, so, because of that, my time in the studio is precious. And so, when I have the time, whether that's 15 minutes or two weeks, like through residency or something, I, I what I feel like is like every move has to count. And so, like, no wasted moves, no wasted energy. Everything has to be moving forward. And so I feel like I can – I know myself well enough. I can spend way too much time contemplating, trying to come up with, like, well, what's the best, what's the best move here? So what I try to do for myself is I set up a structure. I set up a system, which printmaking does on its own because of the nature of the materials. But I set up a – I, I kind of give myself a paradigm, like, the, the, these are your limits, and so you have to do everything within that. And so I provide those limits for myself, and then I just start. And, and so like the way that I might approach an etching, which I just finished a, a large series of small etchings, uh, you know, I might, and I, one of the things I was doing was I'm teaching Italio right now. I was using those plates for my demonstrations. And so my demonstrations even were an extension of, what, of my practice. And so I would be doing things on those plates. Maybe I, I'm de demonstrating lift ground. Or I'm demonstrating uh, hard ground, whatever it happened to be. But I, those moves I'm making, even in that, even in that situation, count. That's part, you know, and all kind of gets thrown into it. And so I feel like um, that for me, and that for me, just um, really gives me a lot more freedom. Even though I'm giving myself more structure, I have more freedom within that structure, and I feel like everything progresses me in the right direction, which is forward. To, to answer the question about the those those shapes that sort of do recur these organic shapes which feel you know <clears throat> kind of simultaneously organic and industrial I feel like I've been drawing those my entire life um, you know I look back and I, I was when I go home my parents have like a lot of my high school artwork hanging and at the time I was doing a lot of wildlife so it's like white-tailed deer mallard ducks and, and things of this nature, but I can see in those things, you know, particular tendencies that I carry with me today, you know, and so my, you know, like my pointillism, uh, like bald eagle, which hangs in my old bedroom, <laughs> you know, or outside my old bedroom, like I can still stop and see that and I can see myself in that work. I can see those tendencies. And so where that comes from, I don't know, you know, I think we just all, um, 
you know, I think I think there's you know it's, there's part of it is is something that you accumulate through through making and through looking at other artists, um, and I think some of it is are are things that you just in, inherently have, are part of you, and so um, if I if I try not to make those things, if I tried not to draw that way, it would. I don't know what it would do, but it, it, that's that's sort of just what comes out of me oftentimes when I'm when I am working, and and so I trust it, you know. And I think that's one of the things I was having a conversation with my grad, one of my grad students just yesterday, and and you know, at grad school, if some of you guys are interested, is is wonderful, but it's also taxing, you know. It's like you it's you're under a microscope in a sense with your work, and so, but you know, so there's, it's riddled with like insecurity and and, and anxiety, but I. I and it was for me too, um, and so. But I, I feel like now, in in relation to, like, I, I don't ask myself as many of those questions anymore as I used to. Like, why am I doing this? You know, like, there's a certain amount of trust that comes with making for a while, and there, and and also I think just you know, kind of being more comfortable in your own skin. And so I feel like if you're more comfortable in your own skin as a person, it's easier easier to be more comfortable in your own skin as an artist. But of course. The academic environment is is meant to create discomfort for you guys, you know, and for my students because it, you it's it's to get to the core of, of 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 what you're doing, who you are, and and it's to be hypercritical, right? So that you guys can ask those really good questions um, of yourself, you know. But I think after a while, you reach a point where you're like, okay, I've answered those, or the answer is in the work itself. I, I, I love the inherent quality of all print processes. And so one of the things I, I do, and I tell, and I say this a lot, is like I've made a living out of making bad prints, you know, which are, um, you know, like when I'm, when I'm, when I'm printing those, those layers in mass, I'm not, I'm not concerned with like how the, the fidelity of each little mark. You know, I let my lithographs fill in. I let my screens dry out or they're, they're like blowing out. And things like that occur through the printing process. And I, I, do, I, I can control that. But I, I, at a certain level, I, I wanna, I'd like to lose that control. So for me, the wood grain, I like, that really, I like a really assertive wood grain. I like the presence of the wood grain because it's, a, it's an acknowledgement of that material. I want the materials to speak. I want the medium to speak. I want it because it's going to, whether you want it to or not. And that's why I'm working with my students. You know, they're always no. I mean, but you know, there, there's there's invariably people experience frustration with printmaking. That's just part of it. It's a hard, ridiculous way to make a picture. You know, but I think you have to shift your attitude in relation to that and you understand that the material is going to do what the material is going to do. And if you and so you you it becomes you become a facilitator for those materials. And we each facilitate in a different way, right? But I feel like it's I, I feel like it's a um, it's a collaboration as much as anything else. And I'm a I love collaborating. I've I've got multiple collaborating partners. I'm getting ready to, to go do a, a collaboration abroad, and and I love that because it's an extension. And like for me, I, like one of the other light bulbs that went off for me was like a lot. Like at a certain moment, you know, like I was, I get, I think I just got tired of fighting, like trying to control the materials, and I and so once I let go of that notion of control, which didn't exist in the first place, <clears throat> um, it, I was much more free within the work. And I allowed myself to, to sort of move in directions that I otherwise wouldn't have moved. And so, um, and part of that came from collaboration with Nick Satinover. Nick was a former student of mine. He's one of my favorite artists too. He's he's, te he, he's teaching um, at Middle Tennessee State University, and and uh, and working alongside Nick was great because he you know like seeing the way he worked, seeing the moves he made, um, and the fact that. You know, like he wasn't afraid to destroy what some what I had made. You know, and not in a in a in a you know like an aggressive way, but it's just like you know for the sake of the work, the sake of the furthering the work. And so we start like that. I, this is a little a bit of an aside, but that collaboration started digitally. You know, trading files back and forth remotely. He was in in 
Dayton, Ohio, and then and then Minneapolis, Minnesota when we first, when we first started working together. And so, of course, you can obliterate something <clears throat> digitally <clears throat> without any real consequences. But then, when we came together and that started happening, it <clears throat> it was it was nice because all of a sudden you don't get again. It's like that notion of preciousness. The the work stands on its own, and you again are like <clears throat> a facilitator there, sort of like caressing it in certain ways and sort of like pushing it in certain ways, but it, it's existing on its own and it's existing outside of you. And that, that, that really for me became, um, obvious in through collaboration because, because it, the, there were two of us or two entities. And so the work didn't really belong to either one of us. And so I enjoyed that. So that's again, something else I try to do within my own practices. Like <clears throat> I don't want to, you know, the, even though the work is from me, I, again, I kind of feel like it just sort of like exists autonomously, you know. And sometimes I walk away from the things I'm doing and I'm just like, I, you know, it's like I don't feel a, 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 that much ownership over it. And that I think, and I like, and I think that's good. I think that's, I think it's, at least for me, you know, I'm not going to say that's the, that's a philosophy everyone should adopt. But for me, that, that's helped my relationship to the work <clears throat> and also my production. Well, I'm looking over at a big pile of <clears throat> plates. I don't know if I can here. Uh, see, it? yeah, you can see all the crap on my desk. So, like those, <clears throat> that's that's just like a one s selection of plates <clears throat> that I've saved. Some of them have been a lot of them been carved on, and 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 some of them haven't. Some of them are found. Some of them are purchased. <clears throat> um, I really like the found plates. Um, found pieces of plywood, things of that nature, because they already possess a, a history that that um, predated me, and so there's there's almost like a <clears throat> an innocence in a sense to that to those things, which again it's it's like I, again I feel like <clears throat> excuse me a facilitator within that, and so it's like I the, I the I kind of hope that these blocks like have a life after me, <laughs> and they get repurposed or reused. Um, and so I don't, I, there, I, I, I like a wood that's easy to carve. Um, I, I would never, I would never carve oak, for example, <laughs> but I don't, you know, I'm material wise. I, I'm extremely flexible. You know, I feel like, I feel like whatever, you know, one of the things I've uh, been doing quite a bit of lately, especially if I'm doing a collaborative thing or, or just need to get some things whipped out is, uh, Pressure print monotypes. Have you guys done much of that stuff? <clears throat> it's so it's so easy. It's stupid, um, and and the results are beautiful. It's like you just take a, a plexiglass plate, you roll a flat, you lay a sheet of paper. Japanese paper works the best, <clears throat> and then you start laying objects on the back of that, and then you lay a temp on like a piece of masonite, or you could use a blanket and run that through the press. And of course, <clears throat> wherever you have those objects, it's going to transfer that information, and they're beautiful. They're, they're outstanding. Um, we had uh, a visiting Andrew Kozlowski who teaches over at Auburn. He came over last fall and, and we made some of these prints with him. And he's really continued this in his own work. If you want a good example of what those look like, um, yeah, K O Z L O L O W S K I um, is his last name. <clears throat> and so that's a really direct, immediate way to work. And so I've done some of these prints where it's like I was literally making prints out of the shop rags that were available <laughs> or the inking cards and creating composition with that. And it's such an immediate and direct way to work. Um, I, I, that's something else I like, but I also like, you know, um, scraping and burnishing, um, an aqua tent for hours as well, you know, cause they're, they're sort of two, two different degrees of the same thing. And so, and they each give you something very different. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a that's a good question and one that I still probably have difficulty answering. Um, I think color is one of those things that, for me, it's always intuitive. You know, <clears throat> very rarely do I set out to uh, create a very a particular color scheme. Um, I I react to you know like I like to play on a, on a slab. You know, kind of play with ink and color the same way I do with layers and information, and so. 
Um, but, I, you know, I think it goes back to the question about particular forms and shapes that, that continue to inhabit the work. Um, it just is part of who I am, you know, like you have your own. And I think some of those things we, we try to account for or we want to account for, but some of those things you just can't. They're just there and, and you just say, okay, you know, it's what it is. And so um, I think my colors have changed over my career quite a bit. I think things have become much more boisterous. Um, but, uh, but still, it's like, you know, it's one of those things you just can't escape yourself. Even when you try and you think I'm doing something very different, then somebody comes over and they look. They look. Somebody else looks at it and they're like, "Oh yeah, that's you know that makes sense coming from you." Even if you're attempting to do something outside of yourself, so yeah. Um, Stefan was a, was a colleague of mine at Wright State University when I was teaching up there. He he's a sculptor. He's a great artist. He's one of my favorite artists. Um, and it's kind of interesting. It's one of those those situations where I find my you know <laughs> my getting a lot of influence from him, but indirectly in a way now. Um, and so he we we we've maintained contact. We we actually exhibited um, a body of his photographs in an exhibition here at UGA a few years ago. And I was really struck by the images. And I said, Hey man, do you mind if I play with those? And he was like, yeah, sure. And, um, and so he sent me the digital files. And so what I started to do, do with those is I was combining them with these found images. I do a lot of digital scavenging. You know, there's so much great stuff online. Not that you, not you should ro rely on Google image search for your content, but there is a lot of really great stuff to be found. Um, so anyway, I started combining those with images of, uh, of, rooms and spaces, interior spaces that had been overcome by mold. And so a lot of those images from, were from like these mold remediation websites, which they come in and, you know, your, your house, you know, after a flood or something like that, you know, because mold obviously comes from water. Like moisture is the enemy of structures, you know, of homes and whatever. And, and, um, and one of the, one of the, main problems is obviously mold, which is bad for you by and large. Um, and so I started just to combine, I found those images really haunting and weird in the way that the mold itself it created a drawing on the wall. Um, I, so I don't know what compelled me to do it, but I just started overlapping his photographs, which were taken in the Arctic. So he had used a pinhole camera and did these very long exposures in the Arctic. And so um, I started overlapping them with no particular, um, like, idea in mind. It was like, see what they'll do. And then all of a sudden it was kind of interesting in how those things related conceptually because the work he was doing in the Arctic, I can't speak specifically to what the nature of that project was, but, you know, a lot of the research that's happening there now is basically the uh, – observing and documenting, documenting the shrinking of, of the polar ice cap, right? And so that those images overlapped with these images of like this, the, this mold, which comes from moisture, which the, the, the shrinking of the polar ice caps is going to result in the rising of oceans, which is going to result in the destruction of, of you know, large, potentially, large parts of our civilization, right? And that, and so those two images in my mind kind of overlapped really beautifully. And I, and I, I love when that happens and, and because it, it was one of those things that happened instinctively and intuitively, but then had legs on its own beyond just the, beyond just the beauty of those images over, over top of one another. And, you know, that's something I always tell my students, you know, like, to, you know, as far as your instincts, trusting your instincts, because you never know when an intuitive formal decision um, <clears throat> will result in um, something extremely meaningful, you know, something with something with a lot of depth, even if it was just, just a, you know, something that was like, oh, this, this looks good, so I'll do it. <clears throat> so oftentimes those things can have a lot of, <clears throat> a, a lot 
a lot in them. And, and we don't always realize that in the moment. Oftentimes it takes a little bit of hindsight. Um, but I think, I think pl pre-planning something like that, if I would have said, I'm going to make a war make a piece about global warming, <clears throat> climate change, it would have sucked. <laughs> you know, it would have just been, had, it wouldn't have been good. But that, it was interesting how that came about. Cause I think it's one of those things. And if you pay attention, it's something we're all aware of, something we're all concerned about. But it's also one of those issues like, what do I do about it?